My name is Michelle Alexander, and I am a former visiting professor and current student here at Union Theological Seminary. And I am so glad to be here with all of you tonight. There is nowhere on earth that I would rather be at this moment in time. So thank you all for showing up. The fact that so many people are here tonight, so many, from all different religions, races, genders, is itself a testament of hope. I know that so many of us are carrying a great deal of grief, fear, anger, internal conflict, and despair into this room. I hope that we can breathe together now that we have arrived, exhale, open our hearts to one another, and listen deeply to each other. We are here, we are many, we are not alone. On behalf of Serene Jones, the president of Union Theological Seminary, I want to welcome you to James Chapel. Serene could not join us tonight because she has a commitment in Washington, D.C., but she wishes she could be here and she extends a very warm welcome to all of you. It's no secret that many people are closing their doors to these kinds of vital conversations right now fearful of what others might say, think, or do in response. And so I am enormously grateful that Serene said yes when I asked her if the Palestine Literary Festival could come to Union and use this sacred space. She said yes, knowing that her decision might invite criticism or rebuke, but she also knew that James Chapel has been a site of many, many difficult, courageous conversations dialogues that are essential to our collective liberation and the creation of beloved community. In fact, it was in this very space that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was originally scheduled to deliver his 1967 speech condemning the Vietnam War. The event was ultimately relocated to Riverside Church across the street due to the overwhelming number of people who wanted to hear what he had to say and our space limitations here. At Riverside, Dr. King stepped to the podium and said, quote, I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. A time comes when silence is betrayal, and that time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. Dr. King acknowledged how difficult it can be for people to speak out against their own government, especially in times of war, and that the temptations of conformity may lead us toward a paralyzed apathy. He did not deny that the issues present in Vietnam were complex, with long histories, and he recognized that there were ambiguities, and that North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front were not paragons of virtue. But he said that he was morally obligated to speak for the suffering and helpless and outcast children of Vietnam. He said, quote, this, I believe, to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation and for those it calls enemy. For no document from human hands can make these humans any less our brothers." End quote. He condemned the Vietnam War in unsparing terms. He decried the moral bankruptcy of a nation that does not hesitate to invest in bombs and warfare around the world, but can never seem to find the dollars to eradicate poverty at home. He called for a radical revolution of values. He said, quote, we must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and material militarism are incapable of being conquered." End quote. Dr. King was condemned by virtually every major media outlet in America for taking the stand, and even within the civil rights community, many imagined that he was a traitor to the cause. And yet we now know Deep within us, we know that he was right. He is right. He is right today as he was back then. 
about the corrupting forces of capitalism, militarism, and racism, and how they lead inexorably toward war. And he was right that our conscience must leave us no other choice. We must speak when the oppressed, the poor, the weak are under attack, when their homes are stolen or demolished, when they are forced to migrate and to live in unspeakable conditions, in open-air prisons, concentration camps perpetually as refugees under occupation, we must speak. We must speak when Jewish children are brutally killed in the name of liberation, when anti-Semitism and Islamophobia slip in through the back door of supposedly progressive spaces, when Palestinian children in refugee camps are bombed and killed, when schools and hospitals and entire neighborhoods are laid waste, we must speak when international law is treated like a naive suggestion, we must speak. Yes, it may be difficult. Yes, we will make mistakes. We are human. And yes, we may be afraid, but we must speak. Countless lives and the liberation of all of us depend on us breaking our silences. And what's required in these times, as I see it, is not only activism and politics, but also deeply personal spiritual work. As Grace Lee Boggs once said, quote, these are the times to grow our souls. All of us have a conscience that whispers to us, sometimes in the dark. The mandates of conscience that arise within each of us arise not out of loyalty to abstract principles or doctrines, but from a place of deep knowing, a deep knowing that we owe something to each other as human beings, that we belong to each other, and that our freedom and liberation depends on one another. If I do not stand and speak up when the bombs are raining down on you, then who will speak up for me, for my loved ones, when the tables are turned? As James Baldwin wrote to Angela Davis more than 50 years ago, and she sat in a prison cell, for if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. James Chapel has been the site of courageous, necessary conversations in times of grief and crisis. And this space has also been a place of joy, art, creativity, and healing. All of that will be in the room with us tonight. So thank you for joining us and welcome. I'd like now to invite Yasmin El Rafay, who is the incredible producer of the Palestine Literary Festival, to the stage. It has been a true pleasure to work with her to make this event possible. Please welcome Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, and um, thank you all for being here. So my name is Yasmin. I uh, work with the Palestine Festival of Literature. Since 2008, PalFest has been bringing writers and artists from around the world to Palestine for a week-long festival, staging free public events in multiple cities across, across Palestine. Some of you have been our guests, participants, and advisors. As we come together in this beautiful sanctuary tonight, churches, mosques, hospitals, and refugee camps in Gaza are being bombed by Israel. Our Palfest colleagues, friends, and partners in the West Bank are living in terror for their safety and the safety of their families. The young writers in Gaza who organized a night of poetry in the besieged strip ahead of the opening of Palfest in Ramallah last May have stopped replying to their messages. Muhammad al-Qudwa, who contributed a poem, a poem to that evening last May, is still occasionally replying to messages and posting on, in, on Instagram. With no food, water, or power in Gaza, and amidst constant bombard bombardment, he, he writes that when his phone lights up, the internet feels like a miracle. 
Some of the writers and activists in the West Bank whose homes Palfest visited just last May and in years prior are having their photographs and addresses circulated on chat groups among armed Israeli settlers calling for their murder. Some of the publishers and editors who have worked with these writers and artists and activists are in this room today. In response to this disaster, we are holding this event as an urgent intervention by writers, scholars, and poets who have worked at the unavoidable intersection of art and politics, who have thought deeply about land, segregation, colonization, history, and liberation. We thank the Union Theological Seminary for taking us in at a time when events in this city are being canceled and censored. This is the fifth space we approached to host us this evening. The difficulty is not because of availability. Meanwhile, I see all of you here tonight and I am told that there are 300 people sitting across the street in the basement at Riverside Church, watching us on a live stream. I'm sure there are many more in the city and around the world watching that live stream. Thank you for watching. I also want to thank Jewish Voice for Peace, whose rabbinical council helped us approach various places of worship to host this event. Their volunteers are also doing crucial work with our ground team tonight. Thank you. And thank you to the many friends and advisors who have helped make this happen on such short notice. You all know who you are. So now for the first part of this program, it's my great pleasure to introduce Muhammad al-Kurd. I, maybe I don't need to say much more about Muhammad. I don't need to say much more about Muhammad. Many of you have seen him doing crucial work in the last few weeks on the media and well before that. And if you haven't, you should follow him online right now. Muhammad is also an award-winning poet and writer. He is the author of the poetry collection Rifqa, and he currently works with Monda Weiss and The Nation. Please give him a big, big welcome and round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Wow, um, I'm not Angela Davis, so <laughs> we can relax. I cried before this, so we can, I can make a joke, right? Um, I, I came here to read poems today, which I don't get to do much often, so I'm very grateful. I want to start, um, <laughs> if you'll allow me, I want to start in Arabic. This is uh, one of my favorite poems, uh, poems ever. It's by a Palestinian writer called Rashid Hussain. It's called Dead Against. ضد أن يجرح ثوار بلادي سنبلة ضد أن يحمل طفل أي طفل قنبلة ضد أن تدرس أختي عضلات البندقية ضد ما شئتم ولكن ضد أن يصبح طفل بطلا في العاشرة ضد أن يثمر ألغاما فؤاد الشجرة ضد أن تصبح أغصان بساتين مشانق ضد تحويل حياض الورد في أرض مشانق ضد ما شئتم ولكن بعد إحراق رفاقي وبلادي وشبابي كيف لا تصبح أشعاري بنادق I am against my country's revolutionaries hurting even a single ear of corn. I am against a child, any child, having to carry a rifle 
I am against my sister learning the anatomy of the gun. I am against what you will. I am against a boy becoming a hero at 10, against the tree bearing bombs instead of fruit, against branches in my garden becoming gallows, against the rose beds turning to trenches. I am against what you will. And yet, after the burning of my land and the burning of my friends and the burning of my youth, how can my poems not become guns? Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read from my book now, so it's less interesting. Uh, this is, since we're on the topic of violence and condemnation and stuff, um, I'm reading this poem called 15-year-old girl killed for attempting to kill a soldier with a fruit knife, or context. Context, fruit knife to a firearm. He was in her throat. 15-year-old girl denounced Violence is not children taking on dragons. For me, it has always been apologies, running to catastrophe with contest, commissioning compassion, turning heroes into humans. This is a refuted revolution. Television said her brother was a martyr, but martyrs go with intent. He went bullet to the head, from fist to flounder. Context is his hand was in his pocket. Toy guns. I told the people that day disclaimer, the dead girl should not have found her rage in the kitchen drawer. She was reaching for crayons. Solidarity often is a refuted revolution. I held my arsenal. People who give excuses for executions fear the rifle more than they fear the reason. I put her in tool, girl to their gaze angel to their accusations. Otherwise, nail file becomes the villain, despite context. Context is they want cats declawed. They want knock doors unanswered. They want the other cheek. Terrorist avenges, headlines delusional. Are all heads equal? Is a soldier's heart equal to her brother's? I'll hold my arsenal. When they ask me about it next time, I'll say God held her hand. Thank you. Um, this next one, I, I, studied in Atlanta, I studied in Atlanta back in the day, and there was a grocery store there called Kroger. Um, I wrote this poem about mainstream media. Um, Kroger. <laughs> I don't have time for an epiphany at the supermarket. Don't have time for an epiphany and so the epiphany has me. In Atlanta, I stay at Omna's on Lynch Ave. Bitterness in the air. Sin sleeps next to me. I invert the syntax. This is the third night and I want to kiss her back but they're bullying the network for having me. And so I'm writing emails instead of poems, eating my fist in the bathroom. I don't want to hear about freedom of speech or my hostility. I've been meaning to sleep for a few weeks. I don't have time for paranoia. Won't flip rocks, won't flip rocks or look for merit in the death threats. If they come for me, let them. I've made my amends. Won't be content in my coffin. It is those stuffing sand in their mouths that worry me most, saying there are softer ways to say this. Thing is, I don't want to be soft. Don't want to humanize shit. Look at my limbs, look at this earth. I've been meaning to eat today, but I spent a thousand mornings since sunrise insisting upon my integrity. I don't have time for contextualization. The journalist interrupts me. The journalist interrupts this tragedy to negotiate another, a history whose debris is still here. What is a fact in Arabic is debatable in English. Contentious. Thing is, if they say evict, I'll still say theft. A reporter asked me whether I believe in violence. Do I believe in violence? Well, I don't believe in violation. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, this is this is the last this is the last one. Um, in uh, July on July 16, 2014, Israeli forces killed Israeli naval fire killed four Palestinian boys as they played soccer on a Gaza beach. This was a pretty prominent issue, and obviously they denied it and then they admitted it. And you know the the playbook. But I wrote about I wrote this poem um, about a people whose biggest crime is that they were not born Jewish. Um, this is a poem called No Moses in Siege. Was it because there were no more graves in Gaza that you brought us to the beach to die? Was it because rubbling us in our houses like our cousins, like our futures, like our gods would be a bore? Was it because our cemeteries need cemeteries and our tombstones need homes? Was it because our fathers needed more grief? We were limbs in the wind, our joy breaking against the shore. Soccer in between our feet, we were soccer in between their feet, no place to run, no Moses in siege. On most days we weep in advance. Here we know two suns, Earth's friend and white phosphorus. Here we know two things, death, death, and the few months before it. What do you say to children for whom the Red Sea does not part? What do you say to children for whom the Red Sea does not part? Thank you. Um, if, if, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. If you'll, allow, if you'll allow me just two more minutes, I want to just say something very briefly. Uh, there is, there is a, there's a poem I really love by an Egyptian poet called Amal Dunqal, and in this poem he says, "Mu'allaqun ana ala mashaniq al-sabah, wa jabhati bil mauti mahniya, li anani lam ahniha hiya." He says, "I hang from the gallows in the morning, and my forehead is lowered by death, because alive I did not lower it." What he is saying in this poem is that those who refuse to bow down will be punished, and those who bury their heads in the sand will be spared. Even in Arabic we say, This is a logic that is felt deeply across the country. The Arab American Institute just released a survey that said that 67% of Arab Americans feel fear um, to express solidarity with the Palestinian people. And I imagine this fear is felt across different communities. It has consumed us. It has infested our classrooms, our newsrooms, our synagogues, our mosques, our churches. It's all around us. And so people are afraid. They're intimidated into silence. They want to keep their jobs. They want to keep their academic prospects. But I'm reminded of something Audre Lorde once said, that your silence will not protect you. And this is, and this has been, this has become so tragically evident in the past three days. A Palestinian family was attacked and stabbed dozens and dozens of times in the safety of their living home, of their living room for simply being Palestinian. A Muslim woman in Chicago was attacked as she sat on a park bench and killed for simply being Muslim. The violence that is being waged on the Palestinian people in Gaza will have effects on all of us. And if we allow them to intimidate us and silence us, we will be crushed. We must speak out collectively because together they cannot crush us. Now, and it's hard to say this sentence, but now is not the time for despair. As the death toll mounts, now is not the time for despair. And now is not the time for fear, because any fear we may have will never compare to the fear of watching the chandelier in your living room shake violently seconds before your entire building trembles above your head. So this is a moment for courage for all of us. So I invite you all, and I invite myself to be courage. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Muhammad, so much. Next, we have a discussion uh, featuring Professor Rashid Khalidi from Columbia, Univer from Columbia University. He's the author of many books, most recently, A Hundred Years' War on Palestine. He will be in conversation with Tanahasi Coates, author of several books as well, including Between the World and Me, which won the National Book Award. Moderating their conversation will be Michelle Alexander, who welcomed us into this space uh, earlier tonight. Michelle is a civil rights lawyer and the author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in, in the Time of Color Blindness. And she wrote about the connection between black liberation and Palestinian freedom years ago. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Alexander, Rashid Khalidi, and Tanahasi Coates to the stage. Thank you both for being here. We don't have much time together tonight, so I want to kind of dive right in. I really want to begin by asking you both about your personal connection to the people of Palestine. Uh, it's certainly not necessary uh, to travel to Palestine or to have friends or family members in Palestine in order to speak and act courageously in these times, but. I do want to honor what you've come to know through the time that you've spent there, and what you've seen with your own eyes, felt with your own heart, and what, in light of your experience there, um, mandates your conscience to speak now. Do you want to begin? Sure. Um, thanks, everybody who's here and is online or wherever you are in the ether. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm extremely pleased that it was possible to put this together. This is the second uh, Palestine Festival of Literature event that has been canceled and canceled again, and the heroic organizers managed to pull it together. They did the same thing in London, where I was supposed to speak last Friday, and it was canceled and canceled again. In London, they sent the anti-terrorism police to the Royal Geographic Society and told them they could not hold the event, but they held it anyway. Um, my My, my connection to Palestine is obviously a personal one. My family is from there. I have family there now. Um, my niece's family is actually in Gaza. Uh, they live in Liman, which is a neighborhood of Gaza right near the sea, or not far from the sea. They fled from their home under bombardment to the southern part of Gaza. Uh, they were being bombarded there, and so they went back to the shelter of their home. And then just two days, uh, just yesterday, um, because they were warned that the neighborhood would be bombed, they moved to the Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza, which is like all hospitals in Gaza, threatened by the Israeli uh, military with being bombed. So that's part of my connection, and I have family in other places there. Uh, I was there last in March, uh, and it was obvious that the situation was on the point of exploding. Um, one has to be there to see exactly how awful occupation and dispossession and, and decades of living uh, as people have had to live, uh, whether in refugee camps or in other parts of occupied Palestine, whether they're Palestinian citizens living as fifth-class citizens in Israel, whether they're in the Gaza Strip, whether they're in the West Bank, whether they're in Jerusalem. Um, I, I, I should say that my wish is that every single one of you uh, has a chance to go there. Um, people who have been there have found it a transformative experience. You actually cannot believe what settler colonialism is like. You cannot believe that in the 21st century this is being done to an entire people unless you see it. I, you can read about it, you can understand it theoretically, but you have to see it. And I, I urge those of you who have the opportunity to please try and, try and go there. Yeah. I, um I, I want to pick up on uh, where we see left off. Um, I uh, 
went with Power Fest, Yasmin, uh, Omar, and all the organizers of Power Fest uh, hosted me. And I was there for five days um, in occupied territories uh, in Jerusalem, and then I stayed another five days after that. And I had this degree of anxiety about going um, because I knew I was going to see something, um, something I couldn't quite name. And I knew because of my upbringing, because of my mother, because of my father, because of my wife, because of my son, because of my community, that after I saw the thing, I would have to come back and talk about it. Um, that there was no option in which I did not talk about it. And I, and I thought I was going to another country. But in fact, what amazed me was I actually felt that I was in the same country. But I was in a different time. I was in the time of my parents and my grandparents. I can think back to um, all of the articles I've read, all the things I've seen said about how complicated and how complex the situation is and the occupation is. I say it's complex, it's complicated. <laughs> and it's made to sound as though you need a degree um, in Middle Eastern studies or some such, a PhD, to really understand what's happening. But I understood the first day. We went uh, to East Jerusalem uh, <clears throat> to try to visit in the way that uh, uh, Muslims uh, visit to Alaska Mosque. And I, and I can remember being there, and there were four IDF guards, biggest guns I'd ever seen in my life. And they checked IDs, and they gave us our IDs back. And then they did nothing. They just made us wait. And we waited, and we waited and we waited. There was no list, there was no protocol, there was no anything. They were just making us wait because they could. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was like, I know what this is. I know exactly what this is. The second day we went to Hebron and I can remember walking down streets with a Palestinian guide and we would get to certain streets and he would say, I can't walk down this street with you. You can walk, I cannot, because I'm Palestinian. And I thought, I, I know what that is. As we drove through the occupied territories and I would look out and I would see roads that Palestinians could use and roads that only Israeli Jews could use, I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw different colored license plates for different classes of people, I said, I, I know what this is. As I saw communities that I can only describe as, as segregated, I said, this is Chicago, it's Baltimore, it's Philadelphia. And I don't mean to center the whole world on America. We have a tendency to do that. But my lens is my lens. This is all I have. And what I felt was a tremendous weight. I felt the obvious thing that I think all of us feel, that our tax dollars are effectively subsidizing apartheid, or subsidizing a segregationist order, a Jim Crow regime. But I also felt that as an African American who was reared on the fight against Jim Crow, against white supremacy, against apartheid, I, I, I felt tremendous shame. How could I not know? How could I not know that the only democracy in the Middle East as it builds itself is segregated? How did I not know that? And, and what, I, what I came to, Michelle, was that Israel is a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, in the exact same way that America is the oldest democracy in the world. <laughs> so the relationship was quite clear. It was, it was quite clear, it was palpable, it was felt, and, um, and the responsibility was clear after that. So let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the history. Um, 
both of you have written a lot about the importance of understanding history in order to engage meaningfully with our present. Um, both of you have talked about history as ongoing processes rather than as complete, finished, and in the past. And you've written that there was no isolated event, the Nakba, that began and ended in 1948, but rather a hundred years war on Palestine. And so I'm wondering if you could share with us what you think people need to know, need to understand about the history of Palestine in order to act in meaningful and courageous ways now, and also what do they know, need to know about the history of Palestinian resistance, since it is so often portrayed in the media in such an ahistorical fashion as though Palestinian resistance is driven by hate um, rather than by a natural, unquenchable yearning to be free. And so share with us what we need to know in your view. Thanks, Michelle. Um, what we need to know, all of us, is more about the history. Um, what we need to know is, I think, summed up in the title of the book that you just mentioned. This is part of a hundred years war on Palestine. It's not a war in Palestine. It's a war to implant a settler colonial presence at the expense of an indigenous people, which is being pushed out slowly but surely. And when we say the Nakba, the disaster, we start, by talking, we start by talking about what happened in 1948. But that's part of a much longer process. Can you explain what happened in 1948? I will. In 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes, starting months before the State of Israel was created, including 70,000 people in Jaffa, 70,000 people in Haifa, the two of the largest Arab cities in Palestine, 30,000 people in Jerusalem, all of this before Israel was even created. And then, once Israel was created, once the war between Israel and the Arab states started, hundreds of thousands of more were driven out. That was not a result of war. That was part of a settler colonial process which dictates that you must eliminate, reduce, push out the indigenous population in order to replace it with settlers. That is what Israel is. Israel is a national fact, but it is also a settler colonial fact. It is a fact very similar to the facts that were created in Ireland by settlers sent over by England to push the indigenous population to the west of Ireland. Settlers brought to this country to push the indigenous population west and out of the land that white colonists wanted to settle. It's different, but it's exactly, it's different in its specifics, but it's exactly the same process. And the war is not one between equals. It is a war between a indigenous population and a externally supported, powerful uh, uh, movement rooted always in Western Europe and the United States. This is the metropole for that project. This is where that project gets its money, its guns, its vetoes in the Security Council. Without that, we wouldn't be where we are. Without the Balfour Declaration, without the British, without the British and the French, without the United States. And I think it's really, really important to understand all of these facts, that it is a, it, this, uh, this has been a process which is driven by a demographic imperative to create a Jewish majority in a country which until 1948 had an overwhelming Arab majority, to create a Jewish state, which was the objective of Zionism, in an overwhelmingly Arab land, you had to reduce the Arab population. And in order to do that, you had ultimately to use force. That's what the Nakba starts with, force. Uh, hundreds of thousands more are pushed out after the 1967 war. And in the interim, there's constant pressure on Palestinians to leave. Permits are revoked. Residencies are revoked. You're not allowed to enter. Uh, you're, not allowed to, uh, you're, you're not allowed to retain this citizenship or to live here. All of it designed to squeeze the population either out 
of the country or into smaller and smaller spaces. You can call them Area A, Area B, Area C. You can call them Bantustans. You can call them Native American reservations. It's the same thing. It's the same process. It's the same logic. It's the same racism. And the, the, I guess the last thing I'd say about, about the history is that in this unequal struggle, which involves unremitting violence, uh, one of the first leaders of the Zionist movement, a man named Zeb Jabotinsky, the spiritual father of every government since Yitzhak Shamir's government, he said, he said it, we need an iron wall, we need force, or we cannot do this. Every native population resists its dispossession. That's not me, that's Jabotinsky. And he said it again and again and again. And that is what has produced Palestinian resistance, unremitting violence. You cannot have dispossession. You cannot have people's homes and property taken away without the use of violence. You cannot force 750,000 people from their homes without violence. And that is what the Palestinians have suffered in this war. And they have resisted. Sometimes they've been successful. Sometimes they've been unsuccessful. Sometimes that resistance was political or nonviolent. Quite frequently, it was violent. Violence inevitably breeds violence. And every time the Palestinians have tried to resist nonviolently, the response was almost, even, almost more ferocious than violent resistance. Why? Because if boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or action before the International Criminal Court, or the great march of return in Gaza a couple of years ago, when Israeli snipers shot down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of unarmed demonstrators, if those things can succeed, then Israel is naked in a way that it's not uh, uh, when, when, when the resistance is violent. So when you ask wh why do you have violent resistance, you have violent resistance both, be both because in order to impose this settler colonial reality on this people, unremitting, unceasing violence has been applied to them. And because uh, uh, finally people can t only take so much. People can only take so much. And so uh, I, I, I think that in order to understand this and in order to advocate uh, effectively for this cause, it's really necessary for us to understand all of these things, to understand the legal aspects, the kind of things that Nora Arekat has written about, to understand details about the politics, the kinds of things that many other people have written about, and to understand the history. Um, this has been portrayed by a movement that is political, that is national, I'm talking about Zionism, that is economic, that is military, but is also a public relations project. It has sold a picture, what you were talking about, ta which people have swallowed with their mother's milk. And it is necessary to deconstruct that, and the only way to do that is to know better than they do the reality uh, of what has been happening in Palestine for more than 100 years. Tanahasi, can you, well, you can respond to that, but also I'm especially interested in your thoughts about the history of black solidarity with the Palestinian struggle and kind of the extent to which you think it's vital for black people um, to be in solidarity with Palestine and the struggle to free Palestine today. Yeah, well, I, I'll say a couple things. I, I think it's really important to acknowledge something. Um, and that is that, I, you know, I'm a relative latecomer to this. Um, it, it's not something that I had a real knowledge of. I had an intuition for it. I had an awareness of the tradition. But it really was not until I went there that I had um, a tactile feeling for it. One of the things that I will probably be making amends for until the day they put me in the ground, if I'm honest, um, is in one of my most celebrated works of journalism, when I had to demonstrate tangibly how a repar uh, uh, reparations program could be done, I looked to Israel. And you know, like I think about that, and one of my golden rules about writing is that you know you only write after you've recorded, you only write after, and I wrote without going. I wrote without going. Um, and so while there is this long tradition of solidarity, 
Um, for me personally, there's a thing of making amends. Um, and it is terribly, ferociously important to me. Um, I think about that and I think about how gracious people were when I was over there. I think about how they took me into their homes. I think about how they fed me. And I think about how their only request was, when you go back, don't lose your voice. That was all they asked. That was all they asked. And so for me, um, I am obviously aware of the tradition. But this is like personal. You know what I mean? Like I, I have some debts to pay. You know? And I, and I, I think like, it's really, really important to be, that I be clear about that. Yes, well. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I came late to my awareness as well. Um, I had heard things, um, including one time from a friend, a good friend who is not prone to hyperbole, who went to Palestine, returned, and said, you know, I was active in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and had been to South Africa many times. Says, but what I saw in Israel and Palestine was worse than what I had seen there. And I remember filing that fact away somewhere, what he said. But imagine that the work that I was doing at home was what was most deserving of my attention. And it wasn't until the Ferguson uprising when I began to hear that activists on the street who were facing tear gas and tanks, was, they were getting advice from Palestinians halfway across the globe, tweeting to them about how to deal um, with militaristic occupation and attacks and following um, the experience that those activists had in Ferguson, many of them went to Palestine um, and came back with stories and deep knowledge of the history. And as I began to learn more, I also came to learn that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee <laughs> um, was staunchly in support of the Palestinian cause, that Muhammad Ali had identified himself as strongly in support of the Palestinian cause, that there was a long tradition of you know, black activists um, standing in solidarity with Palestinians and um, I have to give a shout out to my sister's new book. She's a historian. She just published a book called Fear of a Black Republic. Um, it's about Haiti and the rise and the birth of black internationalism in the United States. Um, but it is that long history of black people understanding that their struggle for liberation crosses boundaries and that solidarity is necessary across those boundaries, I think is calling to us now. And um, the fact that Palestinians were supporting folks in the street of Ferguson and who also, I've heard, were showing their support um, for people in Flint, Michigan, giving advice about how to survive when your water shut off. And so it's encouraging to me um, to hear about that kind of international solidarity um, in this time. But let's turn to some political realities in the United States right now. Um, the United States support, as we all know, for Israel has been absolutely unwavering for decades, um, even among supposedly progressive politicians and elected officials. Um, uh, Mark Lamont Hill and Mitchell Plichnik have written an excellent book um, called Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics. And I'd love to hear from both of you a little bit about these political realities in the United States right now. Um, we are witnessing in real time exactly how unshakable 
The support is for Israel as the Biden administration refuses to draw any lines in the sand or place any limitations at all on the billions of dollars of aid that we send to Israel every year, even as it commits horrific war times broadcast around the globe. Um, why is our government um, not only tolerating this, but sending billions more dollars to Israel? And before you answer, I want to note that I think a clue can be found in a speech that a young US Senator named Joe Biden delivered on the Senate floor in June 1986. It's available on YouTube. He said defiantly, quote, if we look at the Middle East, I think it's about time we stop apologizing for our support for Israel. There is no apology to be made, none. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not in Israel, the United States of America would have to invent in Israel to protect our interests in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent in Israel, end quote. So what was Biden saying exactly? <laughs> what do we need to understand about U.S. support for Israel? Hot potato, eh? I think we need to understand a bunch of things. We need to understand that there's a strategic thing there, serves American imperial interests, has always done. Um, that's why the British started this project. They did not do it for the brown eyes of the Jewish people. They did it because it was in the strategic interests of the British Empire. And that's one reason the United States does it. We do not give $3.8 billion a year plus the $10 billion that Biden's asked for additionally this year for anything to do with sentiment. It has to do with strategy. It has to do with oil. It has to do with interests, imperial interests. It has to do with a couple other things. It does have to do with the evangelical right. That's one of the things that moved Britain to support the Balfour Declaration, to support a Jewish national home in an almost entirely Arab country. And it's one of the things that moves American politicians, the votes, the money, the concentrated political power of the evangelical right. It has to do with money. Our politicians are whores. They're bought and sold. That needs to be said. And the bigger, the bigger the donor, the more services they get. And that's part, of the, that's part of it. And if we ask, why is it that our media is so complicit? Well, it's partly because our media is a echo chamber for the people in power in Washington. I read the New York Times some mornings and I say the New York Pravda Times. And I read the Washington Post, I read the Washington Izvestia Post. They are it, like the Soviet press during the Cold War. They are, whether it's the Ukraine war or whether it's this war, they echo power. But they also echo money. Who owns the Washington Post? Jeff Bezos. Who owns MSNBC, NBC, MSNBC, NBC Universal? Who owns those institutions, those institutions of the press? The same people who own the politicians. The same people who own our universities. Who runs our universities? Who runs our universities? Not the presidents and the deans and the department chairmen, chairmen and women. It's the board of trustees. What is the board of trustees? It's the same people who finance the politicians, same people who own the media. So if we see a compliant media with a government that is supportive of Israel because of votes, because of the evangelical right, because of imperial uh, uh, strategic objectives, it's very simple. When we see university administrations kowtowing to one narrative on Palestine, as they have done right across the country, it's for the same reason that our media does it and the same reason that our government does it. It's money, it's power. It's very, very, very simple. Um, I, I, I can give you a more sophisticated explanation, but I think that that really sums it up, frankly.
<laughs> I, don't, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting because I reflect on the fact that... To Can I say something? I, I, I hope I did not insult uh, 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 sex workers. I, I did not mean to do that. I did not mean to do that. I'm very sorry. Appreciate it. They're far, they're far above politicians. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I think we should probably spend a minute talking about censorship. Um, fear and censorship. Um, I know that both of you have significant experience with censorship, having your work censored, I do too. Um, and we have seen in recent years um, the censorship of books labeled critical race theory, which turned out to be a very broad category. Um, books about LGBTQ um, people and issues. Um, kind of the scope of censorship keeps broadening, um, but we are seeing now kind of new forms or very old forms of being born again of censorship in this kind of war context. And um, I do worry about the possibility of us entering into another McCarthyite era the challenges of finding a site just for this conversation, um, I think speak to the real risk of that. And I wonder if both of you, um, and I'll start with you, <laughs> say a little bit about where you think we are right now in terms of censorship. And as was mentioned earlier, people have real fears, fears that are grounded um, you know, in reality, the possibility of losing jobs, of retaliation, and even being attacked violently um, or killed as a result of expressing their views. Um, where are we now in terms of censorship? What do you fear? And how do you think people ought to respond in this moment in time? You know, oddly enough, I think we're in a great place. <laughs> Um, and I, I, I don't say that blithely. I say that, um, as you mentioned, having some very, very direct experience um, with my own work being banned in schools and libraries. And then this week, um, helping where I could, um, and ultimately, you know, it was you, Michelle, but trying to, you know, figure out where we could hold this event and seeing, you know, Yasmin go through all of the, you know, hoops. So. What I've gleaned from that is when people start resorting to instruments as blunt and direct as book bans or uh, not allowing discussions, uh, they're threatened. Um, it, it's the weapon of a, of a weak and a decaying order. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll just tell you a little story. i never forget, I came back, right? I, I come back from Palestine, it's like, um, you know, late May, and I'm, I'm going crazy. Like, I'm going to sleep, and I'm, you know, dreaming about Palestine, and I'm, you know, waking up, and I got that glassy-eyed look in, in, in my face, and my wife is worried about me, and everybody's worried about me, and I, 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 I emailed a friend, um, and I said, um, do you have a, a, a contact uh, with uh, uh, Rashid Khalidi at all? And he said, yeah, I do. And he connected us, and I wrote him, I said, listen, man, you don't know me from Adam, but I gotta talk to somebody about what I saw. And he said, it's okay. He said, look, I'm having a dinner this weekend. Why don't you and your wife come? And I, and I came, and we sat in community, and it was the thing that I needed. And among the many things that she said that night, he said, I have been fighting this fight for a long time, and I've never seen our side this strong. I've never seen the students at the university so galvanized. I've never, 
And <laughs> The, the, you can confuse the ferociousness of the pushback with strength. You know what I mean? But, but the fact of the matter is, in African-American history, for instance, uh, here in our struggle, um, the struggle is the most violent when people are the most threatened. The original uh, uh, and the oldest and the most lethal uh, form of, of domestic terrorism was pioneered uh, after the Civil War. And what it was was in response to the fact that suddenly you had multiple states throughout this country with black majorities. You had a majority black legislature in South Carolina. The pushback had to be ferocious. It had to be violent. It needed to be because of the sheer strength of the threat. That's generally been our history. And so now in this moment, when I look out and I see you know, not just my work band, um, but I see the work of my colleagues' band. I see, as you mentioned, LGBTQ uh, authors' band. When I situate myself within the history of, of, of black writing, and I understand the fact that there was never any safe moment for black writing in this country's history. When I understand that when Frederick Douglass pu publishes his narrative, and he goes and he talks about it, he has a price on it. He can be dragged back into slavery at any moment. When I said that Ida B. Wells was driven out of Memphis, Tennessee for reporting on the lynching and the murder of her friends and, and she continued to report on it nonetheless. When I understand that Elijah Lovejoy was, was shot to death and his press was shoved in, into the river. You have to be um, realistic about this moment. What happened to you, man? You had to find another location for your talk tonight. That was it actually quite simple compared to the long history of things. My wife uh, was kind enough um, to send me an article about uh, this district where they had banned Between the World and Me, right? And, been, and this is a deep red district. And there'd been this whole fight about it. And they went and they interviewed the library. And the librarian said, this is the most checked out book we've ever had. <laughs> that's not because of me, that's because of the band. You understand what I'm saying? And, and so, like, the very fact that you guys are here, the very unfortunate fact that some of you who are watching this couldn't get in, you know what I mean? The fact that we had to struggle to find a venue for this event doesn't say anything about the strength of this movement here. It doesn't say anything about our strength. It says a lot about the threat and what people feel and the weakness. So, I don't know. I, I like... <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows that I am not one known for my optimism. <laughs> but, but I feel it in this moment. I, I really do. I mean, I, I don't have much to say <laughs> after that. Um, but I, I, I'm completely convinced that Tanis is right. The, the first thing is this idea that the international community supports what Israel is doing, acts as if the United States, Western Europe, and a few white settler colonies in Japan are the international community. They aren't. They're a pimple on the backside of humanity. <laughs> the international community is India and China, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Congo, Nigeria, Brazil. I could go on. Those are the people who voted in the United Nations for a ceasefire, 120 countries. There were 14. There were 14 that voted against. Six island nations, the United States, Israel, and a bunch of hangers-on. That's not the world. The world is actually with us. Indeed, in this country, the press, no. The politicians, no. The universities certainly know, and by that I mean the administrations. But look at the campus that I, I teach on. Five years ago, Columbia students voted overwhelmingly in support of boycott, divestment, and sanctions of companies that support the occupation. <laughs> overwhelmingly. Same thing happened at Brown. Same thing happened at Barnard. Same thing happened at Michigan. Same thing happened at almost every university where the thing was put to a vote. The students are with us. 
by a vote. We know that. Uh, I was on the television the other day for my sins. It's a terrible <laughs> thing to go on television. I promise you, don't do it if you don't have to. And I, I mentioned that young people are with us. And the, God bless her, the interviewer said to me, yeah, there's a poll here that says on Biden's handling of the Gaza situation, in the age group from 18 to 35, he has 10% support. 10%! I could give you, I could give you, I could give you more polls. They are terrified of us. That's why, that's why we're getting censorship. All right, well, we are running out of time. Um, but I couldn't end this conversation with bringing it back to kind of the question of conscience and what's required of us in these times. Um, we're sitting here in James Chapel, and um, I began earlier talking about Dr. King's speech against the Vietnam War. Um, Dr. King called the United States the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And he was condemned for it. You know, Time Magazine called the speech demagogic slander that sounded like a script from Radio Hanoi. And the Washington Post declared that King had, quote, diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, his people. So, Tanahasi, I would love for you to share your thoughts both about that speech, the media's reaction at the time, and also kind of what it might teach us about what's required of us now. That speech is incredible. I literally listened to it last night, uh, but it, it is, I mean, it's incredible. I was going to say it's ridiculous, but that's probably, <laughs> it is, it's ridiculously good. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to um, take, take that in a different direction. I, I think, you know, as, as largely because of, become of, my, because of my upbringing, um, I think largely because of where I was in the world, um, I, I probably did not comprehend the ethic of nonviolence. Like, I, I just didn't get it, you know? Um, and, but I always knew, like, when I read that speech, I still didn't get it. But the fact that he would hold the United States government to the same standard, as he said in the speech, that he would hold you know, uh, young folks in the ghetto on the west side of Chicago, I, I thought, wow, okay, well, he really believes it. So there was this sincerity. It, it has taken years, and I've tried to work this out in my work, to, to understand nonviolence as an ethic. And I understood it in Israel. Um, King would talk about like the corrupting influence of violence, like what it, what it did to the soul. And, and I have to say, and this is really, really important, um, as much as I saw my world through the eyes of the, of, of the Palestinians, I saw um, what I can only describe as an alternative history through the eyes of Israeli Jews. I understood how um, pain, oppression, genocide, how you can take the wrong lesson from it, and how you can take the lesson that the real problem is that I did not have power, that I did not have the guns. And, like, it was sad. I went to uh, Yad Vashem, and it was a deeply, deeply moving experience. Like, just incredibly, I can remember coming in and the first thing I saw was like this um, collection of home movies that had been taken before the Holocaust and it just, I mean, it broke me. And I walked through and anybody tells you it wasn't as bad as they say it was, it was bad, it was worse. And I was so clear on that. And I got to the end <laughs> and I walked outside and there was a line of young soldiers out there with guns. And I just thought, what would it mean for all of the suffering that I've endured as a, as a, as a black person individually? What, what would it mean for all of the violence that we've endured ourselves, for all the babies that were bombed in churches, 
for the fact that we as a people are the products of rape and sexual assault, that it marks every one of us down to our genes. What would it mean to have suffered some 250 years of enslavement, a period longer than our, our, our time of freedom? And to derive from that, that what we really need is power. And what we do with that power really doesn't matter as long as we safeguard ourselves. I was watching the news yesterday and I, and I saw, in fact, my, my congressman actually. And journalists asked him, he said, he said, how do you measure the amount of death, the body count? At, at what point is it enough? As wh at what point do you say, you know what, this is actually too much, this is actually tipping into something? And my man couldn't give a number. He couldn't say when it was too much. Mm -hmm. And some people will watch that and get angry, and I understand that. And I watched it and got really sad because I understood it. And I understood in me how the rage, the anger, the deep felt pain of your own oppression how you can take the wrong lesson from it. Mm -hmm. And that's really what King was trying to ward, like, I, like, at that, like, then I got him. You understand what I'm saying? Then I got, like, he would always talk about nonviolence for your soul, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then I got it. Like, I really, really understood. So, you know, as much as the lessons were really, really clear that I got, and as much as I, you know, thank, you know, my Palestinian host, I have to tell you, I mean, the opportunity to observe Israeli society was like a, um, I mean, it was a peek into a way not taken, maybe because that wasn't an option. Thank God it wasn't an option. Um, but there was a deep, deep sense of sadness. It was the most unsafe place I've ever felt in my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean in the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. I mean in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. I felt power. I felt people with power. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel uh, a safety. So would you like to share any final words? We've got, we've got to close now. And um, you know, I think as we sit here as in the center of the most powerful empire in the world, <laughs> um, we need to think about what our responsibility is as King said in the speech to those who have been defined as our enemy and consider not just like what we must say, but what we must do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts that you want to share. That I do. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I argue in this book that you mentioned is this is not a war on the Palestinians waged by the Zionist movement or Israel alone. It's a war waged on the Palestinian people by Israel and the United States. Mm. Those are our weapons. Mm. Those are American F-35s, American F-15s, American F-16s, American 175 millimeter guns, American 155 millimeter guns. They fire shells of 100 pounds each. I could tell you their kill radius. I could tell you how large the diameter of a 2,000 pound bomb dropped from an American plane is. That's us, our tax dollars, our votes. We have to do something about our complicity in the killing so far of 9,000 people, almost 4,000 of them children, our complicity in the wounding of 21,000 people, and our complicity in 2,000 people being missing. And worse than that, if it, heaven forbid, should happen, would be our complicity in further ethnic cleansing of Palestine. The White House sent Congress a bill for aid to the Ukraine, Ukraine and Israel. It includes provisions for moving Palestinians out of Gaza. 
You can read it. It was sent by the Office of Managing Budget, Management and Budget on the 20th of October. Now the President hastened to speak to the Egyptian President and to the Jordanian King, both of whom had been told by Blinken that the United States wanted them to accept Palestinian refugees to be driven out of Gaza by Israel in completion of an ethnic cleansing process of a Nakba that's been going on since 1948. We must oppose with action, with words, not just weapons that we send to Israel to kill people with being used in that way. In, incidentally, in violation of U.S. law. U.S. law mandates that weapons can only be used for defensive purposes. Why do you think they keep saying in every one of their statements that Israel has a right to defend itself? Because otherwise, otherwise, they would be in violation of U.S. law in sending those weapons to Israel. If killing children in Jabalia camp is a defensive purpose, then it's legal. And if it's not, they're in violation of the law. We must oppose that, and we must oppose the possibility of the United States being complicit in ethnic cleansing. We must oppose it as strongly as we can. Otherwise, we are the ethnic cleansers, and we are the killers. We may not be the ones pulling the trigger. We may not be the people forcing people out into Egypt or into Jordan, but we are responsible. Our government has just said that it's willing to fund that. Now, maybe they'll pull back on it but they'll only pull back on it if we make them stop. Thank you. I'll let you have the final word. You know, I, I, I just want to say thank you uh, once again. Um, I... I <laughs> I saw more of Israel and Palestine occupied territories than I have seen of any country ever. Um, I saw Tel Aviv, I saw Haifa, I saw Jaffa, I saw um, Bezet, I saw Ramallah, I saw Susia. I, I, I saw so much and I had tutors all the way through. Um, uh, when I'm sitting right here, um, I went to Sheikh Jarrah and, and Muhammad tutored me. Um, I am back here. I got to spend some time with Nora, and Nora is tutoring me. I started your book. It's incredible. <laughs> and so I just, um, I, 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 I think um, I feel privileged to have the opportunity to see in somebody else's struggle, not just my own, but like, as you were saying, to have my consciousness heightened, to understand more about myself through other people. Um, and you know, my, my only way uh, to say thank you, my only way to pay that um, back is, as I said, you know, to keep the promise that you know, I made uh, when I was over there, and that is to, to use my voice. I'm much more comfortable using my pen, um, but in the midst of bombs being dropped on children, we have to speak. We have to speak. Thank you. So, next we have readings from Natalie Diaz. <laughs> Mojave poet and teacher, and a great friend um, to, to myself and to many, many of us at the festival. Um, Natalie has won a Pulitzer Prize and many other honors for her books, When My Brother Was an Aztec and post-colonial love poem. Please welcome Natalie to the stage. Uh, I want 
Anja Hotan, Evak Edum, Hakulo y Manch. Me estoy alegre de estar aquí con todos ustedes. Gracias, all of you, for your work. Mi wife, Iwali Zik. I am going to, uh, I'm arriving to you here uh, at this podium uh, thinking of a Fanon quote. Um, a colonized people is not alone. In spite of all that colonialism can do, its frontiers remain open to new ideas and echoes from the world outside. Palestine is not alone. And you are not alone in your presence here for and toward Palestine. Talk privately when you leave here. Stand alongside one another when we are outside of this space. I'm thinking, um, uh, Mohammed had mentioned Lord, Audre Lord, and I'm thinking of the question Lord asks, what are the words you do not yet have? Um, and a question that I ask in her footprints, what is the language we need to live right now? And that language begins with the word Palestine, with the word Gaza. In relationship to that alongsideness, I'm reading a small section from uh, Raul Zurita's INRI. And uh, Raul Zurita was punished at the hands of the Pinochet dictatorship, another structure not unlike this structure. Here is the sea, it says, the carnivorous tombs of the fish. Here is the almond-colored flesh and the sea. The sea weeps, Viviana weeps. There are infinite skies of almond trees, of stars like fruits, they say, and fall. Surprising baits fall from the sky like the stars, like fruits that fall on the grass. There are endless universes in the fish's stomachs, stars, almond orchards. Viviana hears immense orchards of blood-red almond trees falling onto the sea. Infinite clear days raining on the red foam of the sea. People rain down and fall in strange positions like rare fruit of a strange harvest. Viviana hears surprising human baits raining down, amazing human fruit harvested in strange fields. Viviana is now Chile. She hears human fruit raining down like golden suns exploding on the waters. And this is from a little bit further in, from uh, In the Snow. Down below, the cemetery of the crusted mountains which twist. Up above, the pink tear ducts of the stars, the stars before dawn. The tear ducts of the stars are pink like letters soaked in blood, like letters that melt into small flecks of blood like the snow like the phosphorescent gauze of all the mountains. Mauricio, Odette, Maria, Ruben, now they are hundreds of pink tombs on the gauze of the mountains. Here is love, they say. They say to them, it is love which comes down with all the pink snowflakes that the new spring takes to the sea. We speak of a new spring, of a new country that no one had conceived. We speak. They say to them the things that the snows speak, that the snows cordillera speak, of snowflakes that are minuscule tombs that speak as they come down in the thaws and the night encaged in flowers that is the rose pink night of the stars. We speak, they say, of a new country, a new love that no one had conceived. And that's... And this is a June Jordan poem, and um, I know many of you know June Jordan's work. Uh, 
toward Palestine and also how important Nitel Adnan was in opening up that world to her, uh, much the way Palfest has with many of us. Intifada Incantation, poem number eight for BBL. I said I loved you and I wanted genocide to stop. I said I loved you and I wanted affirmative action and reaction. I said I loved you and I wanted music out the windows. I said I loved you and I wanted nobody thirst and nobody, nobody cold. I said I loved you and I wanted, I wanted justice under my nose. I said I loved you and I wanted boundaries to disappear. I wanted nobody roll back the trees. I wanted nobody take away daybreak. I wanted nobody freeze all the people on their knees. I wanted you. I wanted your kiss on the skin of my soul. And now you say you love me, and I stand despite the trillion treacheries of sand. You say you love me, and I hold the longing of the winter in my hand. You say you love me, and I commit to friction and the undertaking of the pearl. You say you love me. You say you love me. And I have begun, I begin to believe maybe, maybe you do. I am tasting myself in the mouth of the sun. Uh, it, and it's my luck to be alongside and to have this, the small gift of poetry um, and, and the, uh, the elders who have been in front of me. Um, this is another quote uh, from Fanon. For a colonized people, the most essential value, because the most concrete, is first and foremost the land. The land which will bring them bread and above all, dignity. This is a s <laughs> And this is a small epigraph from Mahmoud Darwish, and then I will end with this, uh, a poem of my own. We admitted that we were human beings and melted for love in this desert. Alchemy horse. American, they said, but horse I dreamed and horse became. I was cleaved from human earth, red sap, lymph, calcium, atlas and femur, a new chaos, come forth through the world's foaming crust, then licked into my own skin, a flesh being bearing its first dream self. I came to life how stars appear, of dust collapsed till struck to light. Dream erupted, Gila monsters, lava black land, all its thunders. In this great magnetic field, I am a knowledge system. My hair is a tangled Mojave dictionary and my tongue is a danger. I speak a dark whip into the Habub's gold throb. This valley's bright weather is my ceremony. Flash flood is my medicine. As every river to its sea, how I clean myself of self. America, hoard of property, is a debris of my cells. Limestone, wound porous, seafloor, basalt, trilobite, camel bones, glass, and black mountain. We professional mourners, crying for our lives and for hire. From dark colonies in the cave behind our hearts, we weep the sun to fall and bats into the sky. We weep the saguaros to bloom, eastward and moon white, soft petaled wounds circling the night wrists and crowns. Grief is our lush and luxury. 
the strain of anything that grows. Sand rose, ironwood, smoke tree, we tend dune gardens from what they call deadlands, till the haylight beds reap selenite thorns from the horned toad's backs. In the AM heat warp, vultures ripple the violet sky dome, a swarm of blood glove archivists. They sky write directions to the museum, to the university, to the kindergarten, to the hospital. In this epic of citizenship and real estate, I must arrive everywhere twice, occupied and unseated. One hand the comet, the other who makes the comet come. So call me lodestone or alone, whisper me, the one who will return. In pink twilight, my love and I are effigies, leaching salt through our terracotta hands. My language clays and maps amaranth lather along my thigh. A migration of exile, a self-determined relocation of pleasure. Want me. We are the origin, oxygen and always becoming, blood worms from which new land might grow. How we make soil, then mud where we laid, alchemy of our wet denim skins and gravity. We pulse animal and sensual, thundercats of love greening the desert, pale grasses fruit in my breath, gray green along the belly of the night branch. They have all the money, but all they have is money. Yet we are unacreable. We abrade the transit, the survey, hold tight and repeat ourselves as crystal lattice. Come morning, come mercury light. We are blessed and scattered, shards of a horsehead water jar, lonely for a body and aching for the cool taste and shape the first water once took. This nation is a white, bright, phosphorus Indian burn. I fume and illumine in its quantum arson, indigenous iron alchemy horse. Our brothers are the cold killers, shovelers of silver anthracite, fuel gods of the midnight train, boxcar, jump track, jolt light, vaporing night salt to cloud. Every desert highway is sacred and gas station pumps break our hearts. We have pedal bones white doctors call coffin bones. That's why I'm always dying. That's why I'm always half ghost, half back, half dressed as the war party who will return with a full tank of gas and a stick of scalps. Tonight, the city is a tectonic bone radio. Our ancestors are on every channel. Scorpions whip and fluoresce from the shadows of settler houses. Green-eyed wolf spiders emerge from their dens to do join the dark hunt. We are each the other's passenger. On the horizon, our warrior's volcano. Shatter the cinders from your hair. Watch them eat the day aliens with flame. American Indian horse pyre. The Hohokam canals crack awake, gush their ghost waters through the settlement streets, blister and bone flower. I war whoop out into the empty, displaced of ghost tip of the sea. It ghost sea warp weeps back, spiraling the etched shells of my ear. America, haunted hotel, ship rock, rock wreck, ship of fools, little giant cemetery of braids. Beloved occupiers, we are posting notice. There is no more vacancy. When this world has ended, we will carry our people home. So um, I'm told that in addition to the 300 to 350 people gathered in this church tonight, there are as well the 300 people across the street at Riverside watching 
and m at least 2,200 people watching on the live stream. So that's... <laughs> so that is a 3,000 person audience, um, which is amazing. Um, up next, we have Morgan Basikis. Um, who is a performer, a writer, and an organizer with Jewish Voice for Peace, and has been wonderful in jumping in with us and helping to make this event happen as, as smoothly and securely as possible. Um, Morgan will be reading a letter from the Rabbinical Council of JVP. Please give Morgan a big welcome onto the stage. <laughs> Really honored to be here tonight in support of Telfest's incredible work. And as a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, one of so many Jews around the country and around the world who with our whole beings reject Zionism as the racist colonial ideology that it is. Who with our entire being stand with Palestinian people in their struggle for freedom, for justice, and for liberation. who with our entire being stand, reject the weaponization of Jewish pain and Jewish history and Jewish tradition to justify Israeli colonization and apartheid and occupation, <clears throat> and who with our whole beings reject the smearing and the targeting and the censoring of our Palestinian, our Arab, and our Muslim siblings as they speak about the truth of Palestinian life and the importance of ending Israeli colonization and apartheid. I'll be reading a letter from um, Rabbi Alyssa Wise and Rabbi, um, um, Rabbi Brant Rosen, the co-chairs of Jewish Voice for Peace's um, uh, Rabbinical Council. As rabbis and Jewish leaders, we join you in your despair, your grief, your fear, your fear, your terror, and your uncertainty. We know all too well that in moments of intensified Israeli aggression, there are accelerated attempts by those who fear peace by those who fear freedom, to shut down voices who imagine a new world. Given the unspeakable scale of Israel's current actions in Gaza, the, su the suppression of voices of justice and peace are at an all-time high. As people of faith, we believe this silencing must be overcome. Our sacred traditions insist that voices of justice are able to ring out louder and more fiercely than the calls for continued war. Critiquing Israel's actions is not anti-Semitic. It should not need to be said, but let's say it again. Critiquing Israel's actions are, is not anti-Semitic. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. Challenging Israel's behavior is a good way to show solidarity for Jews. It is a good way to be a good friend to Jews. Writers and artists and poets are vital right now to help us imagine new futures and inspire us to get there. We cannot think of a more critical moment to present this landmark event about the struggle for justice in Palestine. We know that so many in this room and beyond it have encountered fierce pushback and retaliation for speaking up, but nothing, doing, nothing worth doing in times of crisis and urgency are without risk. This is a time of profound moral reckoning, and history will judge us by what we did or did not do in this moment. We all must have our answer. With love, Rabbis Brant Rosen and Alyssa Wise, co-chairs of Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council. Thank you. Now, we will hear from Nura Rakat. <laughs> Nura is a human rights lawyer, scholar, and the author of the book, Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. 
It is with deep respect and admiration that I'm bringing Nora to the stage tonight. Please give her a huge welcome. Absolutely, yes. I cannot tell you the joy I have right now, joy that I have not felt in many, many weeks, but the joy that I feel right now in your company, the joy in being able to gather with a testament to our ancestors, with a testament, a commitment to the generations after us, that we are fighting, that we fought for our humanity, that we were here that we said no, that we gathered, that we had no fear. I am so happy to be with you here, with the folks in the Riverside Church, with the folks that are, are streaming with us. When I thought about this evening, I did not know if I should speak to you as a teacher and tell you about Gaza, Gaza. Should I tell you that Gaza was once a city district of historic Palestine that sits on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. That its harbor and fertile land has made it a focal point of trade and empire for centuries, including the Romans, the Mongols, and Napoleon's France. That prior to 1948, the Gaza district contained almost 90 towns and villages. It was 38 times larger than the current 140 square mile strip, making it the largest district in mandatory Palestine until, until Zionist militias destroyed a majority of these towns. Should I tell you that upon Israel's establishment, a severely truncated Gaza absorbed nearly 25% of Palestinian refugees exiled from their former homes, increasing its population from 80,000 to 280,000. That that number has grown to 2.2 million today who are predominantly refugees and children dependent on food aid for survival. Do I explain to you that Israel began to circumscribe this Palestinian territory in 1993 as it was entering into the Oslo Peace Accords. That it began a process of de-development, isolation, containment of Gaza with the intent to make it a Palestinian statelet and to instead focus on annexing the West Bank whose land it coveted and whose natives it also sought to remove. In this context, I can tell you that Israel imposed a land siege and a naval blockade, hermetically sealing this coastal enclave, placing it on a subsistence diet just above starvation, relegating it to conditions of bare life, and then systematically pummeling it with advanced weapons technologies in a bid to take the land without the people to achieve in Gaza by warfare what it seeks to do in the West Bank through martial law, in East Jerusalem through administrative law, and throughout historic Palestine through civil law? Or should I speak to you as an attorney and tell you that when Israel withdrew its settlers and military infrastructure in 2005 that it maintained its effective control over the population registry, the skies, the underground water sources, the electromagnetic spheres, all points of ingress and egress, and thus remains an occupying power with the duty to protect its civilians, that Israel has no right to self-defense against territory that it occupies. It has no right to self-defense against territory that it occupies no more than Portugal had the right to self-defense to protect its hold on Mozambique and Angola. Yeah. 
Should I explain that people fighting a, 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 against colonial domination, alien occupation, and racist regimes, Palestinians have a right to use armed force so long as it's regulated by the laws of war. <laughs> Would it be helpful to tell you that any force must be bound by principles of distinction and proportionality, and that Israel has promised to disavow both. Its top military and political brass have made clear that their purpose is destruction, not accuracy. There are no Palestinian civilians that hospitals and schools and sources of electricity and fuel are not afforded the presumption of civilian infrastructure. Do I remind you that they have expressed a specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a people based on their racial, ethnic, national, or religious grounds? Should I remind you that they need not kill a single person in order to be prosecuted for the crime of intent and incitement according to the Genocide Convention? Should I recite the numbers anyway that in 26 days, Israel has killed more Palestinians that were murdered in the Bosnian genocide? Do I tell you that for the past two decades, Israel has not gotten away with murder, but has changed international law to make its grotesque violence permissible? That it says Gaza is not occupied, nor is it its sovereign, it is a hostile entity that it claimed that this is not a civil war, nor is it an international armed conflict, but it's this new category, an armed conflict short of war. That Palestinians participating in hostilities are not merely legitimate targets when they pick up arms, but even when they lay asleep next to their partners in homes filled with their families. That the lives of their soldiers are more, worth more than the lives of enemy civilians, and proportionality is forward-looking, so that untold destruction is reasonable and recommended in the language of law. Do I remind the world, do I remind you all, that what happens to Palestinians now sets a new precedent that means that everywhere, anywhere in the globe is not safe? No, 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 no. I should speak to you plainly as a mother. I should tell you that my heart breaks over and over every single day. That I cannot take another image of a baby covered in dust from the rubble that was her home, gasping for air that I cannot handle an other young girl running after her mother, her mother's corpse, asking her to get up. That it pains me to watch young, a young boy begging the man about to bury his baby brother for a strand of hair from his baby brother's head. That I have to admit that I am in sheer awe of Wa'il Dahduh, who buried his wife and his son and his daughter, who both wanted to be journalists like him, and got up the next day in front of a camera to continue to report the genocide of his people. <clears throat> Shall I ascribe, describe my acute stress imagining 130 newborns in NICU 
at risk of death because of lack of fuel and electricity, only to look up and hear anchors ask me if the price is worth paying because some civilian life is sacred. Or that when I ask my cousin in Ramallah this morning how her children are faring, she says they have learned a painful lesson these past weeks that world powers agree that their lives are not worthy. Do I speak to you as a Palestinian and tell you that we are a remarkable people fighting for the noble cause of freedom? That we understand clearly that this is a genocidal campaign intended to complete the Nakba, to fulfill the Zionist fantasy of a land without a people, despite a valiant people that refuse to disappear, who vow to stay in their homes rather than become refugees again, who tell us, Len narhal min huna, len narhal min huna, len narhal. whose pride and love and rootedness and tradition and song and prayer and belonging will forever, forever haunt settlers who build nuclear weapons, marshal global superpowers, and still tremble before the truth of our existence. We existed before Zionist colonial invasion. We exist now even among the rubble of humanity's remains. We will exist when Zionism is dismantled bit by every racist colonial bit. Let me speak to you, let me speak to you as a comrade and tell you that we must fight on, that we must rest and breathe and not tire, that our efforts are causing global vibrations and generational change, filling streets from London to Cairo, Amman to Beirut, Istanbul to Sana'a, shutting down Congress, shutting down Grand Central Station, shutting down Highway 101 in San Francisco, having a State Department official resign, a UN human rights officer resign, having Chile, Colombia, and Jordan rescind their ambassadors, watching Bolivia cut its diplomatic ties, listening and witnessing 2,000 plus black allies signing on to a letter in Palestine, when three million Belgian unionized workers refused to transport Israeli weapons. We have disrupted Senate appropriations hearings asking for more money. We have watched hundreds of artists call for a ceasefire and poll 66% of Americans that oppose this genocide and call for a ceasefire now. That number keeps growing, that number keeps growing, and as your comrade, I want to ask you and remind you that as we fight on to be vigilant because repression is growing, to remind you that in our vigilance, we can protect ourselves. We need not cower. Palestine Legal, the only legal institution in the United States dedicated to protecting activists and allies in order to keep fighting, has documented 400 incidents of harassment, abuse, doxing in the past three weeks alone. On average, annually, they document 200 to 300 incidents. But in the past three weeks, 400 incidents alone, law students who had their offers rescinded, medical residents who have been fired, editors in chiefs of art magazines who have been fired, uh, fashion magazine, ed or excuse me, uh, entertainment agency executives who have been set aside for opposing genocide. 
And while this racist, warmongering media and political establishment has led to the stabbing of a six-year-old Walid, uh, Walid Fayumi 26 times in his home in Illinois, Allah yirhamak. And the murder of a Muslim woman in Texas, Allah yirhamak. The Biden administration is mobilizing law enforcement to surveil social media of university students struggling for Palestinian liberation. The White House press secretary in absolute disregard for intellectual honesty and journalistic integrity and in absolute offensiveness to us, anybody with common sense, has compared our calls for ceasefire and an end to genocide to tiki torch marches in Charlottesville. These are incredible, incredibly scary times, but incredibly inspiring times of what we are capable of together. We can only win if we stand up and fight back. Do not be silenced, but speak with vigilance. And here, if I can humbly ask for your support to donate to Palestine Legal. For those who have not had the heart, the will, the opportunity, the ability to speak up, donate to Palestine Legal. Help Palestine Legal, which only has six staff attorneys taking on this entire edifice. Help them protect the front line so that the rest of us can fight. We need a defensive front and we have the institutions we need to support them. We also know that a generous foundation has agreed to ma match that donation that you make this evening. So I end by telling you what we already know, that we will continue until there is a free Palestine, until our, all our kin are freed from cages, until these lands are free, these stolen lands are free, until all our siblings can live in safety and dignity, until freedom, until freedom for all. May we be triumphant. Donate to Palestine Legal. You can do that very easily on their website. Super easy. Um, so now we will hear from Reverend Rashad Hoggard, who will be reading passages from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence. Please welcome him to the podium. sisters and brothers all in the struggle for human life and dignity, peace be with you. An excerpt from our universal prophet for justice and for freedom and liberation. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., April the 4th, 1967, just feet away, a few feet away at the Riverside Church. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silence, and to speak from the burning of my own heart as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam. Many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. And at the heart of their concerns, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your own people? They ask, and when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly saddened, for such questions mean that the inquirer, inquirers have not really known me, my commitment, or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In light of such tragic misunderstanding, 
I deem it a signal of importance to try to state clearly, and I trust concisely, why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea about my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia, nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Neither is it an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front a virtue, nor do, should we overlook the role they must play in the successful resolution of the problem. While they both may have justifiable reasons to be suspicious of the good faith of the United States, life and history give eloquent testimony to the fact that their conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Tonight, I wish not only to speak for Hanoi and the National Liberation Front, but rather to my fellow Americans. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, there came the United States determined that Hoi should not unify the temporarily divided nation and the peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern detectives, our own chosen men. Per diem. The peasants watched and cringed as diem, ruthlessly rooted out all opposition, opposition, landlords, and refused even to discuss reunification with the North. The peasants watched as this was presided over by the United States influence and then by increasing numbers of United States troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was overthrown, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictators seemed to offer no real change, especially in terms of their need for land and for peace. The only change came from America as we increased our troop commitments in support of governments which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. All the while the people read the leaflets, received their regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under the bombs and consider us, not their fellow Vietnamese, their real enemy. They moved sadly and apathetically as we herd them off the land of their fathers into concentration camps with minimal social needs that are rarely met. They know they must move on or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go, primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we poison their water as we kill millions of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas, preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the hospitals with at least 20 casualties from American free power. So far, we may have killed a million of them, mostly children. They wander into towns and see thousands of children homeless, without clothes, running in packs on the streets like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers, soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. What do the peasants think as we ally ourselves with the landlords and we refuse to put an action into our many words concerning land reform? What do they think when we test our latest weapons on them, just as the Germans tested our new medicine and new tortures in the concentration camps of Europe? Where are the roots of the independent Vietnam we claim to be building? It is amongst these voiceless ones. Now, there is a little left behind to build on, save bitterness. Soon, 
The only solid, solid physical foundations remaining will be the found of our military bases and in the concrete concentration camps we call fortified hamlets. The peasants that we may well wonder if we plan to build our new Vietnam on such grounds as these. Could we blame them for such thoughts? We must speak for them and raise questions they cannot raise. These too are our brothers and our sisters. Perhaps a more difficult but nonetheless necessary task is to speak for those who have been designated as our enemies. What of the National Liberation Front, that strangely anonymous group we call VC or commun communist? What must they think of the United States of America when they realize that we permitted the repression of cruelty, when helped to bring them into a space of resistance groups in the South. What do they think of our condoning the violence which led to their own taking up of arms? How can they believe in our integrity when now we speak of the aggression from the North, as if they were nothing more than essential to war? How can they trust us when now they charge them with the violence after the murderous reign of Diem, and charge them with the violence we pour every into every new weapon of death into their land? Surely, we must understand their feelings, even if we do not condone their actions. Surely, we must see that men we supported pressed them into their violence. Surely, we must see that our own computerized plans of destruction simply dwarf their greatest acts. How do they judge us when our officials know that their membership is less than 25% communist? and insist on the giving them the blanket name. What must be the thinking when they know that we are aware of their control of major sections of Vietnam, and yet we appear ready to allow national elections in which this highly organized political parallel government will not have a part? Is our nation planning to build on political myth again and then shore, up, shore it up with the power of new violence. Here is the true meaning of the value of compassion and nonviolence, when it helps us to see enemies' points of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment for ourselves from his view that we may indeed be the basic weaknesses of our own conditions. If we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers we are called in opposition. So too with Hanoi in the north where our bombs are, are in the land and our mines endanger the waterways, we are met by a deep but understandable mistrust. To speak for them to explain this lack of confidence in Western words and especially their distrust of American intentions now. In Hanoi are the men who led the nation to independence against the Japanese and French, the men who sought membership in the French Commonwealth, and we betrayed by the weakness of Paris and the willfulness of colonial armies. If it was they who led a second struggle against French domination at tremendous cost, then they were persuaded to give up the land they controlled between the 13th and 17th Peral as temporary measures at Geneva. After 1954, they watched us conspire to Diem to prevent elections, which they could have sh surely brought to <coughs> excuse me, Ho Chi Minh to power over a united Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, and they realized they had been betrayed again. When asked what do they need to do to not leap and negotiate, these things that must be remembered. Somehow this madness must cease. We must stop now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak for the poor of, the, of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. 
I speak as a citizen of the world, for the world as it stands aghast at the path we have taken. I speak as the one who loves America to the leaders of our own nation. The great initiative in this war is ours. The initiative to stop must be ours as well. It is with such activity in mind, in the words of the late John F. Kennedy, that come back to haunt us. Five years ago, he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Increasingly, by choice or by accident, this is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin, we must begin rapidly to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and, motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and military militarism are incapable of being conquered. A true, rev a true revolution of values will cause, soon cause us to question the fairness of justice of many of our past and present policies. On one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will not only lead to an initial act. One day, we must come to see the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed that they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see an edifice which produces beggars needing reconstruction. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for all embracing and embracing an unconditional love for all mankind. This often misunderstood, this often misinterpreted concept so readily dismissed by the world as a weak and cowardly force has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of man. When I speak of love, I am not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. When I, I am not speaking of that force which is a just emotional boss. I am speaking of that which forces all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Judah, Jewish belief about ultimate. Ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another, for love is God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He or she that loveth and not knoweth God, for God is love. If we love one another. God dwelleth in us, and God's love is perfected in us. Let us hope that this spirit will become the order of the day. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you to all of you. Um, we've come to the end of the night. We have a lot of work to do. Let us not tire. Bombs keep falling on Gaza. 
and we must each find our answer. Free Palestine, see you later.